Welcome to the International Peace Institute. We're very glad to have you here today. I'm Maureen Quinn, a senior advisor at IPI. We're very pleased to host with the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute North America today's policy forum, Monitoring International Arms Transfers, Recent Trends. Our topic is very timely uh, with uh, this week's work at the United Nations of the Small Arms and Light Weapons Preparatory Committee. Now, I have a few logistical notes before we get started. Uh, first of all, our event is being webcast live. Secondly, if you know you uh, like to use Twitter, we have the tags for today's event. They were up a minute ago. Um, hashtags are arms trade, CIPRI, uh, IPINST for IPI. So please participate. So um, with that, I'm very pleased uh, as well to introduce our co-host, Dr. Chantal de Young Udrat, who is the executive director of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute North America, known as CIPRI for short. Chantal is an expert in her own right on security issues, including disarmament, international organizations, arms control. So we're very uh, pleased to uh, co-host today. So Chantal, over to you. Well, thank you, Maureen, and thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, as Maureen said, I'm uh, Chantal Leon Artat and the executive director of this very new office of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we opened and had our opening on February 6th, uh, so we're really uh, just a young little infant right now. Um, I would like to thank uh, the leadership of IPI, and in particular Maureen Quinn and Pim Valdry. Do I say this right? Um, for hosting us here today, this is our maiden event in New York City, and uh, certainly not the last, and we look forward to very close partnership and cooperation with IPI. Uh, now, before I turn things over to Maureen for our panel discussion, allow me to say a few words about CIPRI and about CIPRI North America. Um, you know, if you would ask me what characterizes CIPRI, I would say there are three things. Uh, first of all, I think CIPRI, much like IPI, has international vocation. Uh, and if you look at the staff of CIPRI, uh, you actually find very little Swedes or very few Swedes in, in Stockholm. Uh, so CIPRI has a very international staff. It has a presence uh, now not only in North America, but also in China. Second is that CIPRI has an enduring commitment to independent research, uh, to the notion that solid analysis has to be based on empirical evidence, uh, has to be based on hard data. Uh, and I think it's very fitting that uh, this inaugural event here in New York features one of the flagship programs of CIPRI, uh, that of the arms transfer program. And Paul Holtham, uh, you will soon meet, and his colleagues in the military expenditure program are doing a terrific job uh, each year prov providing us with uh, new data that we all have uh, come to rely on, both inside as well as outside of government. The third is that um, CIPRI, besides it, its flagship programs like the military expenditure program, like the arms transfer program, has also, in particular in the, uh, in the recent uh, decade, uh, broadened its research agenda uh, and looked to uh, other issues of importance to the international peace and security agenda of the 21st century. Um, let me just flag a very robust China program, uh, which of course has been helped with our presence there. Uh, a very interesting security transport program, which has obvious linkages to the topic that we're talking about today. Um, and another program I maybe should mention because it is very much related to what the UN is doing here, is a program on uh, the new geopolitics of peace operations. What does it mean when you get uh, new uh, countries involved in uh, troop contributives? Now, I think CIPRI, as far as CIPRI North America, uh, we will engage and broaden this, this uh, research agenda. And initially, we will focus on four main areas in terms of research. Uh, the first is uh, women, war, and peace. 
And here there are two projects that we have already uh, started. One is a conference that I'm doing with a number of colleagues at the US Institute of Peace, at the University of California um, in Berkeley, with PRIO, a conference on sexual violence in conflict and post-conflict settings. And that will take place in the fall in DC. And we might do a, uh, a iteration of that conference here in, in New York as well. The other is a project on a sort of a framework project on 1325, UN Security Council Resolution 1325. Uh, how is this implemented? And how can we make sure that states indeed implement this very important resolution? Uh, the second area of focus will be on global health and security. Uh, again, a very uh, topical issue, but unfortunately an issue where the think tank community is not really so much engaged, particularly, I would say, in, in Washington, D.C. A third area is on regional security issues, and here in particular we want to look at the Central Asia region. Uh, particularly when uh, the US and European allies are withdrawing troops, uh, what is going to happen in the region? And we are arguing that we need to pay more attention to the regional dimensions. And then last, but certainly not least, on arms control and proliferation. This is the bread and butter of CIPRI. Um, and we're still sort of looking what would be the right project to engage on here. But we're thinking about uh, nuclear weapon-free zones, uh, tactical nuclear weapons and how to engage non-nuclear weapon states in these types of negotiations. Now, as we build our program, uh, we are looking forward to partnerships and cooperations with other institutes, with think tanks, with universities, with governments, with international organizations, both here in the United States as well as in Canada. And um, with that, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, go to our website, it's uh, ciprinorthamerica.org, and we look forward to uh, being here quite frequently and engaging with you on these important issues. Thank you. So thank you very much, Chantal. Uh, today, uh, as uh, Chantal said, we are very lucky to have Dr. Paul Holtum, who is the director of the CIPRI Arms Transfers Database. And he's traveled here from Sweden. And he's going to present and share the latest data from the well-known and um, authoritative CIPRI Arms Transfer Database. Um, uh, Dr. Dr. Holtum, Paul will present a, a PowerPoint. I think it's easier with the PowerPoint to uh, visualize uh, some of the data. And then we will turn to our two panel uh, discussants, Dr. Tom Kanto from the United Nations and uh, Ambassador Abdullah Al Saidi here from uh, the International Peace Institute. I, I just want to briefly introduce uh, Paul. Uh, Paul is a senior researcher with the CIPRI Arms Transfer Program, and he has been the director of the program since 2009. Uh, Paul's main areas of research relate to monitoring international arms transfers with a focus on Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia, promoting greater transparency of international arms transfers, and efforts to strengthen transfers controls and combat arms trafficking. So thank you. And with that, Paul, over to you. Uh, thank you, Maureen, and thank you to IPI and to CIPRI North America for the opportunity to present CIPRI's latest data on transfers of major conventional weapons, new orders, and new deliveries made during 2011. I'll go straight into a discussion of the data, and as Joe Friday of Dragnet said, I'll just try to present the facts in this presentation, but I'll open up the floor for discussion, and I hope to contribute to some of the discussions behind the increase overall in terms of arms transfers, um, where these arms are going, and from whom. So my intention is to provide some basic headlines and highlights from my latest data. Um, although I welcome the opportunity to dig more deeply into that in a moment. 
So as a headline, as I hope you saw in yesterday's press releases, Cipri Arms Transfers data indicates that there's been a 24% increase in the volume of arms transfers of major conventional weapons between the two five-year periods 2002 to 2006 and 2007 to 2011. And as this slide shows, the largest volume of transfers have gone to Asia and Oceania, followed by Europe, the Middle East, the Americas, and Africa during this last five-year period. But beneath these headlines, and this is something we could perhaps discuss uh, later, there have been significant increases in the volume of arms transfers to East Africa, North Africa, Southeast Asia, and the South Caucasus. But before further discussing the situation with regards to importers, I'll now touch upon the situation with regards to major suppliers of major conventional weapons. Here, I guess the headline is, it continues to be dominated by five states. The USA remains the undisputed largest supplier of major conventional weapons during the last five year period, followed by Russia and then three EU member states, Germany, France, and the UK. Together, these states accounted for around 75% uh, of all transfers of major conventional weapons during 2007 to 2011. It's also worth noting that there are several other EU member states in that top 10. But beneath this headline is the fact that although the top five has remained unchanged for decades, their share of international arms transfers is declining. I think here it's worth flagging up several non-European suppliers as well in terms of states that are emerging as major suppliers just outside the top 10. For example, South Korea, South Africa, and Brazil have increased their transfers of major conventional weapons and are competing not just against each other, but against major suppliers in tenders around the world. But I think the main focus and the one that sort of picked up in the media was the rise of China. The volume of Chinese imports has been declining when comparing the last five years with the previous five years, but the volume of exports has increased by 95%. China is now, in our understanding, the sixth largest exporter of major conventional weapons, touching the UK in its fifth position. But I think it's worth flagging up that one of the main reasons behind this increase has been the increase in arms flows primarily to Pakistan, which in our accounting accounts for about two thirds of the volume of Chinese arms exports. In particular, transfers of JF-17 combat aircraft, but also naval vessels and the licensed production of battle tanks. We, in, according to our data, China has yet to make a major breakthrough in any other major recipient state. But of course, there are smaller volumes that can have a significant impact on regional balances of power, conflict dynamics, and also indicate dependent relationships. I think it's also worth flagging up at this stage that there's concerns within Russia that China is emerging as a major competitor in some of its established markets. To shift to the recipient side now, all of the top five recipients of major conventional weapons during 2007 to 2011 were based in Asia. But I think it's also worth flagging up that in 2011, we saw some major deals concluded by recipient states in the Middle East. According to our data, India is likely to remain the largest importer of major conventional weapons for the coming years, with deliveries of aircraft, naval vessels, armored vehicles, and tanks as part of its modernization and upgrade programs. But one could also argue this is connected with rivalries with Pakistan and China, a desire to be able to project power over a further distance and also internal conflicts. Russia has enjoyed the dominant position as the major supplier to India over recent years, but there's also competition from France and the UK, and Israel has emerged as a major supplier while the US is seeking to also increase its share of the Indian arms market. As I mentioned before, China's decline as a major importer continues, although there are still reports of interest in Russian air defense systems and aircraft, 
and it continues to rely upon foreign suppliers for various components and also licensed production arrangements. One of the tendencies that we note with regards to the five major Asian recipients is that licensed production arrangements involving indigenous arms production facilities account for a significant share of deliveries and also new orders. But it's also worth noting that the record of states using licensed production and technology transfer rela uh, relations to develop indigenous capabilities and to decrease reliance upon external suppliers has a very mixed record. In fact, it's very limited. India, I think, is a good example of the challenges of a state that has tried to develop an indigenous arms production capability. And while China, on a more, li more limited scale, South Korea and Singapore, are states that have had some success in terms of using imported technologies and equipment to develop their own indigenous arms industries. Arms industries that will not only be for contributing to national defense, but also for seeking arms exports. It's nevertheless, I think, worth remarking that in both of these, in these cases also, there will still be a reliance upon, final, upon foreign suppliers, and we're unlikely to see autarky in these situations. While the attention has focused upon deliveries to Asian recipients, I think it's worth highlighting the Middle East. I'll not dwell upon the impact now, or the apparent lack of impact, of the Arab Spring on orders and deliveries, but I will note that our data indicates there was an 8% decline in terms of the volume of major arms uh, exports uh, during the periods, between the periods 2002 to 2006 and 2007 to 2011. And I think most notable in this regard are the declines in deliveries to Israel and the United Arab Emirates, which had previously received large quantities of combat aircraft from the US. Israel has dropped from the sixth largest to the 23rd largest recipient, and the UAE from the third to the ninth. But I think it's worth noting that the UAE is likely to increase uh, as a major uh, recipient in coming years, and there are also several other notable increases in the volume of deliveries to Middle Eastern states. Uh, in our press release, we highlighted that Saudi Arabia is just outside the top 10 largest arms importers, but we expect it to see it increase significantly in recent years, not only with ongoing deliveries of Eurofighter aircraft from the UK, but also as a result of probably the largest deal for the past two decades with the US for more than 150 F-15 combat aircraft, new and uh, upgraded. Second, it's perhaps worth flagging Iraq has gone from the 40th largest arms importer to the 19th largest arms importer as it rebuilds its armed forces with international assistance and the interest of various suppliers and something we focused upon in the yearbook a couple of years ago. There's also been a significant increase with regards to deliveries to Afghanistan with a similar profile. As I'm probably going over my scheduled five minutes, I'll conclude and wrap up by stressing that while this presentation has focused primarily upon who are the biggest recipients and suppliers, I think the value of CIPRI's arms transfers database and its data goes well beyond this. And I stress that with our data, we also seek to highlight countries that don't appear among the largest global arms importers, but where there have been significant increases in the volume of imports and where there are concerns for various reasons, whether it be reactive acquisitions, as in the case of Algeria, Morocco, or in Southeast Asia, where there's potential for arms races as in the South Caucasus between Azerbaijan and Armenia, or Thailand and Cambodia. We also can provide information on who is supplying weapons being used for internal repression as in the Arab Spring and Syria. We also provide information on questions that could be raised with, with regard to whether there's an appropriateness with regards to particular acquisitions. For example, the decision by Uganda to procure SU-30 combat aircraft, multi-role combat aircraft, to deal with the issue of the LRA. So I think that our data is intended not just to provide this who's the biggest and broader trends, but also hopefully to inform discussions in particular countries with regards to procurement decisions and also decisions on export. And I'll leave it there, but I look forward to a lively discussion. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Paul. It's always uh, great to start with uh, the facts, and uh, you certainly did a good job of uh, presenting them uh, thoroughly and uh, succinctly. Um, today we have an excellent panel to help us mine this data, the significance of the data for the international community, 
and I'm, I'm honored to introduce our two discussants. And really our objective today is to have a discussion, a discussion among the panel and certainly then uh, the audience uh, as well. We'll have time for questions. So um, I'd like to introduce our, our, two, uh, our two discussants and I'll start uh, with Mr. Kono. Mr. Sutomo Tom Kono is political affairs officer at the Conventional Arms Branch Office of Disarmament Affairs, United Nations. He's responsible for the UN transparency uh, instruments, particularly the United Nations Registrar of Conventional Arms and the United Nations Report on Military Expenditures. Mr. Kono served previously in the Conference on Disarmament Secretariat in Geneva. He advised Under Secretaries General for Disarmament Affairs on disarmament related issues before the Security Council, particularly Iraq and weapons of mass destruction terrorism. Prior to joining the UN Secretariat, Mr. Kono was in academia at several institutions, including the City University of New York, uh, the United Nations University in Tokyo, uh, Columbia, and New York University. Uh, Mr. Kono is speaking in his personal capacity today, and his views do not necessarily represent the views of the United Nations. So welcome, Tom. Uh, we are also very pleased to have our own Ambassador Abdel al Saidi uh, from uh, uh, the International Peace Institute on the panel as a discussant. Ambassador al Saidi is a senior fellow here. Um, he was uh, formerly the permanent representative of Yemen to the United Nations from 2002 until 2011. Earlier in his career, 2009, okay, sorry. Uh, earlier in his career, uh, he held important government positions, including Vice, uh, Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs from 1999 to 2002. Ambassador al Saudi was also a co-chair of IPI's uh, task forces on strengthening multilateral security capacity in 2008. So um, uh, with that, if we may, Tom, I'd like to start with you and seek your comments. Um, particularly, what can you tell us, what do you see, uh, what challenges uh, do these latest arms trusts for data pose for the United Nations, particularly for the transparency interest, instruments such as the register? Thank you for kind introduction, Maureen. Um, I assume many of you are aware of uh, these two transparency instruments. Um, in particular, the register of conventional arms uh, this is a, a very important instrument for which uh, member states have provided their data for the arms transfers in the previous year. And the important point is this is the most authentic data we have because it is, has been provided by member states. And Shipri and the other um, think tank have advantage of uh, taking all the information from the media or our member states and bilaterally, but we do deal with um, most in the most formal way the authentic <laughs> sources of data, and we have been encouraging the member states to, to participate in this instrument. And the more member states participate in this instrument, the greater the potential of this instrument, uh, the confidence building measure and thus security enhancer. So our challenge here is uh, to raise awareness of the instrument because it, many people say, oh, the UN has a certain kind of instrument to report uh, the military expenditure or the arms trade, but very few delegates know. You have a deadline, May 31st for the register, and April 30th for the military expenditure, people call MILEX. But and where the reporting forms are, and where how you, you fill those reports, there are a lot of assistance needs we have, and also we really need to develop more coherent relationship between the member states and the secretariat to facilitate the submission of reports. And I do not prolong my first intervention, but also another challenge is how to utilize this instrument. Member states, diplomats are busy, and they seem to say, okay, we failed, we submit this report. That's it, thank you very much. And then forget, okay, next year, we've got another note verbal asking us to the report. So getting more report fatigue. <laughs> but what is important is to follow up. If you submit 
the report, or member states have the report, then look at what's in there. And is, this reflects a country's security concern. So some countries feel a little bit uneasy about the neighbors build up the arms, so they tend to import more weapons or produce more weapons. So this should be a starting point for discussion or dialogue between the diplomats or the security experts. So is this, I just. Thank you, thank you very, uh, very much. And so Abdullah, um, uh, how about you? What is your take on this latest data and uh, what comments can you share with us? Thank you, Maureen. <clears throat> First, I have a question to ask Mr. Holtum. I notice in the statistics that the United States is the first exporter of arms, and yet it is the eighth recipient of arms. What kind of arms does the United States need if it's the first exporter? Uh, I'm going to speak uh, about the uh, Middle East. You know, uh, in our part of the world, regimes always think uh, the information about budget uh, must remain a secret because it touches on the national security issue. So none of the Middle Eastern countries, I believe, have a public information about their budget, how much they allocate to, to uh, their defenses. Um, you know, uh, but some of these things also has to do with corruption. Uh, but uh, it's interesting that the information by the, uh, by the Stockholm Institute indicates that delivery of major conventional weapons to the Middle East has declined over 2002-2006 and the period 2007-2011. But the trend indicate that this will be reversed, that there will be a decline in terms of purchases of arms. The question for me is, uh, how will this trend square with the Arab uprisings? After all, the Arab uprisings, yes, it was for dig dignity, it was for integrity, it was for fighting corruption, but to a large degree, these revolutions were revolutions of expectations. Economic deprivation uh, is a factor. So how will, how will these new regimes, uh, are they going to squander a lot of these uh, precious resources on armament? It's interesting also to note in this connection, uh, Syria, imports of major arms major weapons increased by 580% between 2002-2006 and 2007-2011, according to the uh, Stockholm Peace Institute. The question again is, how will post-Assad, because I believe they will be a post-Assad Syria, how will, be, how will the post-asset Syria cope with this phenomenon? Will it reallocate needing resources to rebuild a dilapidated and destroyed infrastructure? Because the infrastructure, and I visited Syria, the infrastructure in Syria before the uprising was really in shambles. So will Syria then think of reallocating resources to the infrastructure or will they spend their resources in order to finance new armed shipments? Of course, Syria uh, and the regime say we are a confrontation state in the Arab-Israeli conflict, and the Israelis still occupy the Syrian Golan Heights. So we need to buy arms. But the question then, how to balance how to find the equilibrium between the need of their people and the reconstruction of the infrastructure and to continue with importing arms. And most of their arms, incidentally, 72%, according to the Stockholm Institute, comes from Russia, about 17% from Iran, 17% uh, from Belarus, and 9% from Iran. 
regimes uh, usually are used as an excuse for arms import, uh, national or pan-Arab issues, but particularly the Arab-Israeli conflict to continue in, in spending resources on, on armament. But to, to a degree, by the way, to buy arms is to make the most important institution in these countries, which is the military, to keep them happy, give them new toys, new machinery, new advanced weapons. And, 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 and this is the case, by the way, not only in the Arab world, but I think in the develop, developing countries in general. Uh, the question is how will, uh, and I wonder, if the Arab-Israeli conflict is resolved in a just manner, how will it affect the import of weapons? Because you deprive these regimes of an excuse to buy all this. Of course, there are other regional issues. But most of them, the excuse, whether you are in Egypt or you are in Syria, or even when Iraq during Saddam, they all, uh, and even Iran now, the, I think the crack troops they have is called the Quds, the Jerusalem uh, core. So they all use the Arab-Israeli conflict. I hope that we will find a reasonable solution to the Arab-Israeli conflict which will deprive a lot of these regimes from an excuse to buy, to buy arms, and, and uh, I hope they will then devote their resources uh, to development. You know, uh, the other phenomenon, which, which is very interesting, many regimes are cognizant that they will not be able to use some arms they are importing because they are importing very, very sophisticated machinery and very expensive but very sophisticated, like AWACS. I remember the story in AWACS. A country bought AWACS, but the pilots are Americans and the information goes to Washington before it goes to the, to the purchasing country. So the question becomes, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I know in the past great powers used a policy called prepositioning. So the question comes to mind, were this country persuaded to buy arms and someone else will come and use them in contingency cases? Uh, and and I, I think they are, I, I wonder sometimes if they are persuaded to get by this armament. And again, they are cognizant, they cannot use them. You know, I, I believe that uh, money of this money spent on buying armaments can better be spent on alleviating uh, poverty. It's shocking that Saudi Arabia has 25 to 30% unemployment among youth. 600,000 people join the market, the, the, the job market every year. And so when you think of the, the biggest Arab economy, and yet has 25 to 30 percent unemployment among its youth. So I believe that some of this money can be used to, to uh, alleviate some of the difficulties they have there. Because I think that investing in human capital, the economy, will f foster greater prosperity and indeed peace and stability. And then reflecting on the current state of affairs in the Middle East, again, another question I want to pose, the decline in export of Russian weapons to the region was obviously the result 
of political realignment. Egypt, since Anwar Sadat was president, Iraq later, and Libya are no longer purchasing Russian weapons. Therefore, it is interesting to ask whether this reality partly, and I underline partly, informs the current impasse in the Security Council over Syria. Of course, uh, recent polarization, I believe, in international politics precludes for now a possibility of agreeing on a consensus resolution in Syria. But if you follow the development in Syria today, I think it's a moral imperative that the international community work to find a consensus in the Security Council to bring about uh, an end to the strife in Syria. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abdullah. And I think uh, you've raised a couple of uh, uh, points there that will lead to some very good uh, discussion uh, among our panelists. And so. Um, I, I know, Paul, there was this direct question on the U.S., but I thought that it was a, a good discussion there of the issues around Syria. But there are other countries as well in the Middle East uh, uh, that there's uh, issues around uh, arms. Uh, and certainly there's the, in the news a lot the, the, the discussions in the case of, of Libya. The third point I would uh, draw the attention to, and hopefully a little bit discussion, is the issue around the sales of uh, advanced military aircraft. Uh, both within the Middle East and beyond. And maybe, maybe Tom, as, as well, you could discuss some of the, the challenges around monitoring transparency related to those uh, air, aircraft issues. So, Paul, over to you. Okay, well, I'll, I'll deal with the easiest one first in terms of uh, the U.S. being a major exporter, but also amongst the top ten importers. Um, with regards to his import profile, we, we record... Uh, deliveries of armoured vehicles and artillery from a variety of states in recent years, many linked to the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but it's also worth noting that, like many of the other major importers that I mentioned, a lot of this is actually produced under licence within the US. So it's a, it, we monitor not just international transfers of physical items crossing borders, but also items produced in a country under licence granted by another supplier. Can I, can I follow that? which means that the United States does not uh, sell some countries its own artillery. They buy the Russian model, which the Iraqi used to, to use. And, and, and because I, I think this is, this is partly is the answer. They, they, they buy arms from third party to someone like the army in Afghanistan or something like that. Is that, is that the case? I mean, that, that is one development you have, but the development I'm talking about is things like the enormous demand for mine-resistant armored protected vehicles um, that led to the U.S. sort of seeking supplies from outside its borders, as well as um, equipment that had been developed in other countries that rather than develop your own, it was worth acquiring the license to produce that yourself. Um, and I think that's one of the issues that, that comes up in, in our accounting there. And I think it also comes back to the point that I raised earlier in terms of it's, it's very difficult to divide everyone simply into your importers and your exporters. Um, no one is, at the moment, I think, able to produce everything themselves. There's a lot more multilateral arrangements and, and co-production across borders, um, which is a challenge for us in terms of the traditional way we've approached the issue. And I guess for Tom, it, it also comes through in terms of the way that the register operates with a very state-centric approach. But I think that the, the tale of the international arms transfers today is much more complicated. Um, and that's something that, that we struggle with. But I think that it's, it's a useful point to interject at this stage. Um, would you like me to go on with sure, the other please. states? OK. Um, I mean, with regards to Syria, I think that it, it's perhaps worth noting that the dramatic increase uh, that we reported during the last five years is on top of a very low level of imports in the preceding period. And this is despite, I think, uh, an interest on the Syrian side in terms of upgrading cooperation with, with Russia in the military sphere, uh, with the advent of Putin to the presidency of, of Russia. 
But what we saw was that this sort of discussions were stalled, I think, on payment options. And it wasn't really until we had the restructuring of the Soviet era debt and uh, Russia e extending to Syria, similar sort of situation that it extended to Algeria uh, and Libya after the restructuring of the Soviet era debt in terms of uh, an arrangement that included procurement of extra weapons, new deliveries, that we're really seeing the increase. And it's, we're really now seeing that, I think. Um, but despite that, there's still been concerns, I think, from the Russian arms industry with regards to the ability of Syria to pay um, for, for its orders, both before and also the, the latest order for Yak-130 uh, combat aircraft. So I think there's a, a very complex picture there. But I think that it also, perhaps, it's not so simple to say um, Russia has supplied Syria with a lot of weapons, has outstanding orders, and therefore will veto uh, the UN Security Council resolution. If one looks at the situation with Libya, it, it had intentions to deliver a large quantity of weapons and major deals with Libya too, and yet it voted in favor of Security Council resolutions to impose an arms embargo and also to have some sort of intervention. But I think that the Libya case is a lesson learned for Russia in this regard, and then it's concerned, I think, that the sanctions and the resolutions we used to facilitate regime change. Um, and I think there's concerns on the Russian side in terms of regional stability with another regime uh, falling. And also, as I said, I think there's an important strategic relationship that stretches back decades uh, between Moscow and Damascus. And, and that should be taken into account there too, in the same way that other permanent members of the Security Council have strong strategic relationships with, with various states around the world. I'll, I'll leave it there for now. And um, well, maybe, maybe Tom, if you could speak a little bit, and particularly about the issues about the uh, advanced aircraft. Thank you. Yes, um, the issue of uh, monitoring uh, the increasing yet more sophisticated weaponry. Um, UN instruments, um, UN Register of Commercial Arms have only seven categories, and this was adopted in 1991. And, and the battle tanks, armored combat, vehicles, large caliber artillery systems, combat aircraft, attack helicopter, warships, and missile and missile launchers. Do they cover everything? First thing people think, what about drones? Unmanned aerial vehicles that have become a major issue and one of the most demanded items. Singapore, for example, has ordered a lot of UAVs, and this is one of the most um, demanded area of uh, new weaponry. And also, if you look at the Africa, that, uh, basically the weapon of uh, their choice is small arms and light weapons. And these seven categories do not include small arms and light weapons. However, we have continuously kept this register, scope of the register in review. How do we do that? We have a group of governmental experts. Every three years, they meet three times a week long, in a week long session, and they discuss uh, the relevance of the scope in view of the current uh, change in the technology or importance of those weapons in uh, the security and their warfare. And so we have, a op we have a possibility to amend the scope. And also we have this GGE, so called GGE meeting, which will uh, meet this year and next year. The first session will be in Geneva in November to be followed uh, two additional sessions in New York. And, and so we have another the opportunity to address this issue. Um, regarding uh, uh, small arms, this GGE uh, in 2006, have decided to include this item as part of additional information to report to. And this additional information category has existed, existed since 1991. And, the, and even they are not the official seven categories, small and large type weapons are now report, being reported by many countries. And I have some statistics here. There's a 48 countries in 2001 have reported on the transfers of small arms and light weapons. One sad story of this is Africa, no countries has reported the transfers of the arms. So this is another lost opportunity. If you have a potential to exploit, this is the one. African countries, if they report it, 
their arms, uh, small arms transfer. So we can detect where the arms come from, where they go. And this will help everyone identify where the danger spots, where the conflict may arise in the future. So, so these are the very important aspects. Um, just to mind a little bit further the discussion and some of the points that um, uh, Abdullah made on the, the, the broader Middle East. Uh, Paul, could you talk a little bit about the arms uh, in relationship, the arms transfers in relationship to both uh, Iraq and Afghanistan? You mentioned Afghanistan a little bit in your introduction. I think that could be of interest. <clears throat> sure. I, I mean, again, what, what we're seeing there is a, a dramatic increase from a very low level in terms of imports in the preceding period due to embargo and other factors. Um, and what we've seen in recent years is a, a dramatic in increase um, in terms of equipment being provided by the international community, but also in the case of Iraq, also an interest in taking control of their own procurement decisions um, and going broader than just uh, surplus equipment provided by NATO member states or, or from the US. And I suppose they're the sort of the, the dynamics that we're continuing to monitor in those cases. Um, and I guess, as Tom mentioned, small arms and light weapons, we, I could digress uh, slightly there and talk about some of the lessons learned, I suppose, in terms of the, the errors and challenges with uh, the equipping of those armed forces with small arms and light weapons uh, from surplus stocks that were either, uh, in some cases, let's say, not in a fit state for use, um, which were also transferred under conditions which led to high risks of diversion potential, um, and which I think that the people in, the, in Afghanistan and Iraq are still sort of uh, unfortunately um, sort of not to say reaping the, 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 the problems of, of those transfers. Um, I guess with regards to Afghanistan and, and, the, and the current equipping and the, the cost of that, I guess there's issues there with regards to, as was raised a, a, a moment ago by the ambassador, the fact that the US is, is going to third parties to provide equipment with which the Afghan armed forces are more familiar in terms of former Soviet and, and Russian equipment. Um, and issues being raised there, I understand, in the US, uh, in this case, in the politicizing of, of that issue. Um, and so I, I suppose that, that in both of those cases, there have also been concerns with regards to corruption, which was also raised by the ambassador. So for us, there's an important role in terms of monitoring these particular transfers and arrangements um, in terms of making sure that the acquisitions are appropriate for the security needs and that those security needs are clearly defined and that there's a, a, an interest in avoiding potential corrupt practices um, as these states seek to acquire their own and determine their own patterns of, of acquisitions. Um, but also, I think, in terms of on the, on the supplier side, responsibilities with regards to ensuring that the safe storage for the equipment that's being supplied, adequate training by the people that are receiving this equipment, I guess there's a whole range of issues that, that are being taken into account there, but I think we've had sort of some, some hard lessons to be learned there for the populations of both of these countries. Thank you. And I don't, I don't want to miss the opportunity because Tom had mentioned uh, the drones. Anything about the uh, uh, transfers in, in that category, the unmanned uh, aerial, aerial vehicles? Um, for us, that, that's an area that, that, that we do include in our database, um, <laughs> both reconnaissance and armed, as long as they're, they're at large and capable of, of different missions. And certainly we see a lot of interest uh, around the world in terms of acquiring uh, unmanned capabilities uh, for border reconnaissance, but also for surveillance and, and intelligence purposes. And I guess one of the interesting tales there is that there's a couple of sort of niche suppliers, such as Israel, as well as the US in this case, and that we're seeing also interest in a number of what one would say states without sufficiently developed arms industries seeking a, an ability to develop those themselves. Azerbaijan is a, is a classic case, and I think we've heard um, both last year and, and, and this year of major deals being signed with Israel, not just to procure systems from Israel, but to develop and build them within Azerbaijan itself. And this is something that I think is, is, is worth monitoring also. Thanks. And um, Tom, before, before I turn, um, turn it back, uh, over to, over to the audience. I wanted to just uh, go, go back to you one more time because I know that you have experience in the Middle East, particularly Iraq, and so anything about the arms transfers issues with regard to the Middle East from your, your perspective and from your work at the United Nations? Yes, I have a long, I have a lot of things that I, can <laughs> I want to talk about, but just stay focused on this issue. Um, the reason why, uh, one of the main reasons why the UN Register of Commercial Arms was born was because of the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. When Iraq and Iran had a, 
eight year old, long war. Actually, I served in Iraq between 86 and 88, and I was almost killed by uh, Scott B coming from Iran. So I yeah, know how dangerous it is. But they used this context to acquire weapons. And the war ended in 1988. But what people did not realize is how much weaponry they have accumulated. They didn't use everything, but they continue to import and produce indigenously um, the offensive weapons. And then there was a concern about that the accumulation, dangerously stabilizing, excessive accumulation of conventional arms. So this is a background. And also another background is a Cold War end. So on East, Eastern Bloc have uh, no longer is so reluctant to transparency on the military affairs. So in the confluence of these events, the General Assembly had adopted the a resolution which created the UN register of conventional arms. But this is basically the transparency arrangement to prevent and conflagration of the military conflict. And talking about the Middle East, um, I have to uh, explain that the reason why m most Middle Eastern states have not reported on their arms transfers to the UN. And it is well known that they believe the current register is not adequate because it did not include the weapons of mass destruction, particularly nuclear weapons. Because they believe the most dangerous, most serious threat is WMD in their region. So unless this concern is taken up seriously, they do not see a point in submitting um, any data on the arms transfers. However, does that, mean, does that mean that the register is not useful for the arms trade to Arab countries? And the answer is yes. Because the country which export arms to the Middle Eastern states report their export to the register. And we have a new platform, the database, which was launched last October. And we have a map-based interactive database. So if you click a country, and first, they show the report provides, submitted by the, that country. But also, we have a cross-reference function. That means there's also there's a report which has a reference to the arms trade to that country. So you could see which country uh, arms to the Middle East. So this is another important point. But as the Ambassador Al-Sadi mentioned, if the Middle East is a, did not have Arab Israeli conflict. The enormous amount of resources have been diverted for peaceful development purposes. It's another lost opportunity. Uh, <clears throat> the Arab position in the first committee in terms of the registry is not purely an Arab position. It's, a, it's mostly uh, many countries in the developing world are taking that position. Small exporters of arms, like in Egypt, they don't they don't trust the registry, and because there is the impression that it will curtail their export and it is being manipulated. But look, I, I have a story to tell. It's an interesting story. When I was ambassador in 1994, and and I speak here about the lack of moral scruples for the big exporters of arms. In 1994, uh, 1995, 1996, we received the report, and I welcome the special representative of the Secretary General to disarmament, uh, Angela Kane. Uh, we received the report from the UN that the rocket, the portable rocket used in Kenya to try to shoot an Israeli plane came from Yemen. Of course, it's, 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 it's a bad indictment for us, and I was the ambassador, so I, <laughs> I had to go around, and Sana'a did not give me the information. Later, I knew from the uh, 
a tracing instrument of the UN, tracing instrument, they have something called the tracing instrument, that an Eastern European country exported the portable missile to secessionists in Yemen in 1994. And so they wrote and said, we exported to democratic Yemen in 1994. Oh, that was a good thing for me. I immediately said, there is no such thing in Democratic Republic of 1994. There was only the Republic of Yemen. So this, this was illegally exported. They don't, they don't give a damn about more scruples. They just want to make money. And, and then we come and, and talk about the lack of, of, of uh, compliance by the small countries. But I, I, I just wanted to point out, because it's, it's very interesting, that the others are not, uh, are not abiding by the registry and the tracing instrument. You know, that, that leads me, I just have to ask this question, uh, and particularly of Tom, is that have there been any technological developments uh, that, you know, because what, what Abdullah is talking about is the, the tracing that was used uh, to, to monitor where weapons go. Is there any use of modern technology? Or maybe, Paul, you could answer that question. The, the arms trade and military expenditures are extremely sensitive issues for member states. And we do not have a mandate to analyze and, and we might just comment on <laughs> the data we receive. So our task is collect data, maintain the database in which all data can be stored and archived and made available to member states. Now we have a, a database, a much friendly, user-friendly database. So we are trying to uh, advertise on this, and so member states can benefit from uh, the availability, much better availability of the data. Um, but on the other hand, uh, um, say, what's the point of just collecting and not really analyzing uh, the data? That's a valid question. But this should be done by member states or civil society. If member states give us mandate, we will do it. For example, Security Council has a uh, sanction committee. If the sanction committee did not uh, uh, get their resolutions complied with, so they set up a monitoring panel. The panel of experts go to the neighboring countries and investigate. But this is a, this one exception than normal. And usually we receive the information and we will put up in the website or ask the general report. OK, so I have promised several times I'd open up the questions uh, to the audience. So. Um, we'll go to this gentleman over here and then to the front row. I ask you to hold the mic steady because we are webcasting and introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, I'm John Converse with Vivat International and the Africa Faith and Justice Network. And my question would be, um, it seems to me that CIPRI obtains most of its information from publicly available sources and the UN depends on voluntary reporting. But some of the deadliest arms transfers by states are clandestine or quasi-clandestine undercover deniability. Do we have any way of tracing or finding out about those transfers? Let's take the question. Hi, I'm Jeff Abramson with the Control Arms Campaign. And I w thank you for having such an excellent panel and panelists. Um, I have so many questions, I'll try to keep it to a few. But <laughs> our campaign is uh, trying to lead the civil society call for an arms trade treaty to be negotiated which I think is one of the answers to some of the problems we're talking about here, and that there is no globally agreed definition of what responsible trade is. Uh, I, I have three questions, one for each panelist, but you all might want to take this on. I think, Abdullah, I'd like you to answer your question about what the Arab Spring means in terms of the desire for uh, increased or continued arms sales into the region. I, I see not a ton of optimism for the Arab-Israeli issue to be resolved soon, but still hope that the Arab Spring may lead to some changes. Um, in terms of the register, I, this is sort of a two-part or a linked question. 
maybe following on John's question, it seems there is actually a great deal of transparency out there. So countries who want to keep secrets can't do it so well, partly because their exporters report and partly because people like Paul and Cipri are keeping track of that data. Have countries started to say, OK, I can't actually hide this. Let's start making it transparent. Um, and then for Paul, there were a couple of things in your presentation, but um, I think I'd like to ask you about, you've mentioned some emerging arms races. And uh, if you could elaborate on those and how you decide whether they are dangerous arms races or whether they are legitimate acquisitions to meet security needs. You, you've used this rubric of assessing uh, imports um, and how you're doing that on some of these arms races. Thanks very much. OK, that's a, that's a lot of questions. So I think what I'll do is I'll start with you, Paul, since you're our co-host. Go to Tom and then Abdullah. OK, I mean, in terms of clandestine transfers, I suppose that the first answer is that very often we find out very much after the fact when they've actually arrived and, and had the negative impact, um, and you then follow them back. Um, but saying that, I have colleagues at CIPRI working on a counter illicit trafficking project who look at bottlenecks with regards to transportation and methods for interdicting uh, illicit transfers using air companies that, that are sort of highlighted as of potential concern, but they've also started looking at the more complex issue of the maritime dimension too, and whether there's ways of intercepting and uh, red flagging and taking into account the risks of this dimension is one way of, of resolving that. Um, but I suppose that, th that this, that's <coughs> still for us in its infancy at CIPRI, but something that we're putting more resources into and looking into further. Um, with regard to, to Jeff in terms of the register, I, I don't want to steal Thomas Thunder, but I guess one of the classic examples is uh, when Ukraine reported on its exports to Kenya of tanks and, and various uh, small arms and light weapons, and Kenya submitted its NIL report. And sort of within days, you had the seizure of the finer um, ship at sea carrying another delivery, another consignment. And, and the hoo-ha that we had there with the Kenyans adamantly claiming that this was for them, but all evidence to the contrary suggesting it was actually for southern Sudan is one of the ways in which sort of the, the, you can catch people out if that's what you, you, or you're talking about in that case. I'm really sorry I mentioned arms races. My normal response is to talk about reactive acquisitions, uh, and I'd like, to, <laughs> I'd like to clarify there. But um, I, I, guess, I guess one of the things that one could talk about, and, and one of the, the areas that's of interest to me because of the regions I look at, is Azerbaijan and Armenia, where we've seen a dramatic increase in terms of Azerbaijan's acquisitions of equipment that I think one would call offensive, to use the UN register terms, uh, with regards to artillery and armored vehicles. And although we haven't monitored, a, haven't seen a sort of a strong response in terms of deliveries to Armenia, in the past couple of years, we've seen them sort of announcing reviews and, and talking about committing more resources now to their own arms procurement acquisitions. And considering that I think a number of people, analysts last year, highlighted that as one of their areas of concern. Um, I think that we would say that our arms data sort of alongside a number of other factors w would lead to that being a, a, a potential source of concern. I guess a more benign but still one that's worth talking about is with regard to Southeast Asia, where we've seen a dramatic increase in the volume of deliveries to Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, and Vietnam, I think, will also increase. And I think in that uh, situation, we've seen a lot of naval equipment that's much more advanced than what was there before, uh, including anti-ship missiles. Uh, as well as advanced combat aircraft. And I think that, that in those, some of those countries have sort of laid out their concerns, uh, whether it be with regards to piracy, whether it be with regards to illegal fishing, but also in terms of some territorial disputes um, th that, are, that are being given as sort of some of the justifications for this modernization and upgrading. But I think there's also there some sort of regional rivalries and the keeping up with the Joneses. Uh, that's used by, I think, the military, as was mentioned but by the ambassador, that they utilize that in terms of, you know, our neighbor now has a more advanced system, um, perhaps we should have one too. Uh, and I don't see that sort of necessarily having the same concerns for me as I have with regards to Azerbaijan and Armenia. But I mean, I think there's certainly interest in the region, um, also with regards to the money being spent on some of these advanced pieces of equipment and whether that money could be better spent uh, on other things and whether sort of less advanced systems would be of use. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Tom? Yes. The question of clandestine arms transfers has been a very difficult issue we have been dealing with. There are two different types of uh, cases. The first case is 
um, they are pursued by non-state actors. And in this case, primary responsibility rests with the government. And the government, that's why members of the defense ministry or foreign ministry gather to review the implementation of a program of action and small arms, or now trying to negotiate a new legally binding instrument on arms trade, IETT. So this is exactly what Ambassador Al Saidi highlighted. We really need to have a rule and a regulation so that will prevent non-state actor from dealing in such trade. The second case is a little more tricky. This is if a state, your government is involved in such clandestine transfers. So in this case, um, we need to turn to a, a national means or Security Council established uh, investigative tools. Otherwise, our instrument is based not, not investigative tools. It's just a reporting transparency tools. So we have that, that's our limitations we have. Well, the, the, the Arab Spring, I don't know if it's going to turn into a winter first. And I don't know how it will end. I am, to a large degree, optimistic that enlightened youth now are holding the elite accountable. And you can see in Egypt where the regime, where the military veers away from what they consider the democratic path, then they go and hold them accountable in Tahrir Square. This is the case in Tunis. This is the case uh, in Yemen and, and, and so on. In the end, if the countries graduating from the Arab Spring become democracies and, and relative democracies, I mean, um, then I think you will see a trend where the elite will have to, to try to provide uh, the, the, the better living standard for their people. Otherwise, they will be held accountable. And in the end, I like to, uh, I don't know if I believe in it totally, but there is a concept in this country that democracies don't fight each other. I, I, <laughs> in the end, fighting means buying arms. And uh, this, this idea that democracies don't fight, maybe it will prevail. It's exhilarating in any case, but I don't know about its veracity in, in terms of... Uh, but, but it depends how the outcome of the Arab Spring. I'm sure we have more very tough and thoughtful questions out there. So um, we'll go here to Angela Kane and then way in the back on the right. Thank you very much, Angela Kane, disarmament. I'm day four on the job, so I have more questions than answers at this point. But I wanted to raise two points. And one of them, uh, both uh, all the speakers have referred to, and that's the indigenous arms production. But you haven't really made the nexus between the arms transfer and the, and the, uh, and the production. Because, for example, when you had the two tables about who exports arms and who imports arms, they were same people, the same countries were on the same slate. So unless you state also what is being produced for internal production, how can you actually assess the magnitude or the armedness, so to say, of the country itself? And the other point I wanted to raise was mentioned but wasn't answered, and that is the tracing instruments, because I think that really the tracing is extremely important. And when you look at the New York Times this morning, there was the tracing of the minerals, for example, the conflict minerals. So the thing is that I think the international community is more moving in that direction, and I'm wondering if there's anything, I mean, I know what's done in the UN, but what, what basically is happening out there that can be piggybacked onto? Thank you. In the back. Um, thank you. My name is Amr al from Egypt, and thank you very much for a very um, useful seminar. And it comes very timely as we um, um, consult or negotiate at the other side of the street on, on the Small Arms and Light Weapons Review Conference. That's exactly where my, uh, my question, um, first question is going to be, um, probably to all speakers, but particularly to Mr. Holtum and, um, and to the Secretariat. What will be the impact of, um, of the current processes, both of the arms trade 
uh, treaty negotiation and on the review conference of the small arms, particularly the first, on um, this emerging um, patterns of um, reshuffling of major arms producers. Meaning, if if um, I think the Cypri speaker mentioned that China is catching up quickly with the, with the UK as um, uh, one of the top producers, if the current model of the arms trade treaty, as projected by the chair Maureen Tan, um, if it passes as it is, would that reshuffle or impact the current um, uh, the current list of major arms um, exporters. My second question relates very much to uh, what Ms. Kane just mentioned. Congratulations for the, the new post. Um, and it is uh, on the element of, of production and stockpiles. How far um, will the current processes, particularly the arms trade treaty, but also other processes, anchor the current map of producers and importers and, um, and keep that uh, gap as wide as it is now, uh, or even make it almost impossible to, to bridge. So uh, the element of production and the current processes as well. Thank you. I'd suggest we start again. We'll do Paul, Tom, Abdullah. Okay, th uh, th thank you again for, for a number of more challenging questions to address. I think in terms of the the issue of indigenous arms production and, and the, the transfers, one of the things that I think that we're seeing perhaps is an impact of the economic crisis is that a number of the major importers that are recorded on, on the, the slide are actually sort of placing demands upon transfers of technology um, on, on, on the acquisitions that they're making. And I think that's a key factor that needs to be borne in mind. And I think it also comes into, it should come into play with regards to discussions on, on the arms trade treaty. Um, the, the, the tale we were, we were telling, I was trying to tell in terms of um, a broadening in terms of production capabilities across the world and emerging uh, suppliers, um, I, I think, makes that an important issue to, to take into account. Um, I think also, as I said before, the, sort of the, the, the fact that it's a very internationalized market and the, and the way in which we're not talking anymore about everything being produced in one country and exported wholesale to another. Um, makes it gonna, is going to make it challenging, I think, for the arms trade treaty as well to, to with its state-centric approach, to try and sort of cope with that. And I think we're going to need to be flexible and, and take into account the realities of the situation and therefore I'm encouraged that a number of delegations are engaging with their own arms industries and also with regards to licensing and customs and borders and, and, a, and a wide range of agencies that I think need to be involved in that process to make sure that it's something that, that is practical uh, and, and can be implemented. In terms of the impact of, of an arms trade treaty, um, if I had the crystal ball, I'd be charging you for the answer to what that would be, uh, or certainly seeking funding for, for projects. But I think, um, I, I think that what I hope it will do is it will make things more transparent. I think it will, it will hopefully provide an opportunity for states to hold each other to account. I think, interestingly, as Tom mentioned with the register, states are submitting that information um, and also are invited to submit information on their transfer control systems to various UN instruments. But then there's no forum in which they can discuss this um, side by side. So you have things like the Wassenaar arrangement where a group of exporters get together, but do you have something comparable where sort of so-called the importers and exporters can come together and raise questions about particular decisions or whether they have, uh, as was, was raised before, in terms of particular transfers of concern or whether there's uh, the transfer control system seems to, to be under question. And I think that would be a, a great innovation if that can be carried off. Um, and I think that would make it, I think, very interesting for a lot of states uh, in July to be, to be party to such an arrangement. I think that's where the advantage in my mind certainly would be. Um, and I think also in terms of coming together to see, as, as you said, with the, 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 the Revcon, uh, and as, as I've heard across the, the road, there's a lot of common challenges with regards to combating illicit trafficking and a great need for further international cooperation and various forms of assistance from technical to financial um, that, that could more could be done there. And I just hope that this re these two processes re-energize and that we don't end 2012 exhausted uh, and on the floor. Um, and I guess that's what, how I'd sort of... Uh, my hope for, for this year, which is a major year for conventional arms. Thanks. So, Tom, and particularly, uh, particularly on the, uh, the issues of tracing, too, if you could. Actually, the, my boss has only four days. <laughs> I have been working on 14 years. <laughs> and she already identified the two important issues I haven't talked about. <laughs> 
that's a wonderful start, and I'm really welcome. I'm delighted to have such a, the, the leader who has a both a good sense of uh, where the problem lie, <laughs> lie and uh, the part, uh, and this uh, energy with which we can get together and tackle. The question of the, uh, <laughs> the question of uh, indigenous production first. Um, when the General Assembly adopted the resolution in 1991 to create the register, uh, Egypt and other uh, non-aligned countries raised the, the issue of military holdings and uh, procurement through national production. Because for developing countries, they thought it is unfair because otherwise countries, they don't have to import. They just export. And they thought, if you create such a system, you should disclose your military holdings and procurement through your national production. So these two items are addressed as a part of additional inf background information. And since the inception of the uh, operation of this instrument, we have received information on military holdings and procurement through national production. The question is how many countries have reported? In, nine, in 2011, 24 states reported military holdings, 20 on procurement through national production. Of 193 countries, that's <laughs> not a good record. But we have a system, so we have to exploit it. The question of a tracing instrument, actually, it, I would have been remiss if I didn't mention um, the international tracing uh, instrument, which was uh, agreed in 2005 as a follow-up to um, the adoption of a program of action on, to, on illicit trade in arms, small arms, and light weapons. And this is not a legally binding instrument like a POA. However, this instrument provides a lot of important tools, because this instrument encourages member states to do markings on weapons. So even they do not know where they are, people who catch that illegally traded weapons, they can see where they come from. So marking has become a very important issue as a part of the tracing issue. And also, this instrument has encouraged national authorities to cooperate at the law enforcement level with other countries and also with international organizations such as uh, Interpol or our colleague in Vienna, UN ODC. So in tracking to those illicit trade and um, underground trade, th this cooperation will prove crucial in finding the, the, the illicit route of international trade. These are, these are just I wanted to add. Principally, and that, uh, regarding the impact of uh, ATT and the uh, POA review conference outcome on the, the changing uh, um, configuration of manufacturers, I, I think if we have a stronger instrument, that means there are more responsibility on the manufacturers and exporters, and that is a good thing. Um, so, uh, Abdul, I want to ask you about the dynamics, if you want to say anything. But if I could just go back to you, Paul, on the whole tracing thing. What I'm thinking in my mind is, like, you know, airplanes have a black box. So with all the advances in technology, is there anything today that is could be similar to that in relationship to tracking goods? Or maybe it's out there. Is there any anything that exists? I, I think you've been talking to Jeff Abramson, and this is his pet <laughs> topic from Control Arms. Um, I, th I think that, be that this is something that's sort of addressed by my colleagues on the, the, the counter illicit trafficking project, where they look particularly in terms of the transportation. Um, but also, I think if you talk with people in, in terms of the custom side of things, the way in which the containerization of trade has impacted upon the bundling uh, is one of the factors that could make this a challenge. I mean, Jeff has some interesting ideas about ways in which this could be uh, carried out, but I think there's, there's some practical dimensions that, that, that some states may be unwilling to uh, and companies may be unwilling to sort of take that burden on. Um, but I mean, there's certainly, I think, some people are willing to push that discussion uh, in terms of sort of at least making while something is en route, 
uh, that it doesn't get lost. And then I guess there's also developments, particularly with small arms and light weapons, with regards to storage and stockpile maintenance and security, where there's tagging, uh, where there's ensuring that uh, when weapons are taken out of particular facilities, that they're, they're recorded and it's known who's taken them out as a means to prevent diversion. Because I think one of the, the key aspects we see from the work of the UN panels, of sanction, uh, panels on sanctions is that a lot of diversion and leakage occurs within country and not necessarily in terms of international transfers. And I think those two dimensions are things that are worth uh, taking into account. And I think they're things that are being discussed across the road uh, this week as well. I got the impression that, that stockpile security has, has come through as a, as a key issue. And it's certainly something I think that, that should be a focus in the continuing program of action work. Did you want to say anything on dynamics or no? Okay, so uh, back to our audience. Yes, so we have Pim, and then in the back there. Thank you very much, Pim, from IPI. Thanks for a very interesting discussion. Uh, I have a regional question for Paul. Uh, we've spoken a lot about um, arms transfers in the Middle East, but I'd like to shift the focus back to Asia. Uh, according to CIPRI's uh, data, um, or the data suggests that the five largest recipients of arms are in fact uh, all Asian with India um, being the world's largest recipients of arms, followed by South Korea, Pakistan, China, and Singapore. Uh, could you speak a little bit about what's driving the acquisition of arms uh, in this part of the, the world? Thanks. Okay, in the back and then in the middle. We'll come, we'll come to you. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent briefing. Uh, my name is Ikar Kılıç, I'm from the Turkish Mission. I have, um, few, I have two questions of a more technical nature. Um, I'm also new on the job, like Ms. Kane. Uh, congratulations to you, ma'am. So, uh, so it's a bit, a little bit on ignorance, uh, perhaps. Uh, my first question is to Mr. Holton. Um, when you buy arms, it's not like uh, you have an express service that delivers in 36 hours. It comes uh, sometimes uh, decades later, even uh, when it's late. So, how do you factor this into uh, into your analysis when, uh, in terms of delivery? And to Mr. Kono, my question would be. Uh, how, how is uh, multinational production reported? Thank you. Uh, Roy Esbister from Safe World. A question for Paul. Um, why, why is it, Paul, that uh, you kind of mentioned that states that are attempting to import a, uh, a, an arms, produc arms production um, through license production, etc., cetera, um, that they've had very limited success? Why is it, do you think, that... Um, that, that this kind of imported uh, production isn't taking root successfully. Thank you. Okay, so Paul, then Tom. Well, I have so many questions to answer. I'll try. Um, with regard to the, to the drivers for Asia, I think there's a, a variety of factors, and they differ, I think, between the five. But, I mean, one could sort of broadly say in terms of um, the economies of these countries and many of the others that we've seen are doing particularly well. I mean, I think with the Southeast Asian states, Singapore, but others, there was a, a desire for a modernization upgrade in the late 1990s, but the Asian financial crisis sort of intervened. And I think what we're seeing now is the results of that postponing of that process of upgrading and modernization. Um, and I think for some of the states, that, that's a factor. I think when it comes to countries like India, uh, and also China. But I think one could also talk about uh, South Africa, which has emerged as a, as a major recipient in the sub-Saharan uh, continent, and Brazil, which although not a major importer in our records at present, has some fairly major uh, plans for procurement upcoming. It comes, I think, down to the sort of the regional prestige aspects and the ability to be able to, um, to sort of have the military might to match the economic and political and diplomatic uh, weight that they aspire to. But also, I think, in terms of um, broader regional interests and certainly sort of maritime uh, dimensions that, that mean that they need to acquire naval systems that are much more capable than what they currently have. Um, I think there's obviously some security undercurrents and a number of those in South Korea. I think that its northern neighbor obviously is a major influence there. Uh, I think also that there's a, a, an element from the supplier side in terms of suppliers have been willing to provide more advanced equipment to these states than in the past. And that, I think, also comes into play in terms of accounting for how we've seen the, the volume, but also the quality of the items being uh, provided increase significantly. Um, I guess the US sort of focus upon Asia comes into play there as well. Um, with regards to the fact that, yes, it's not like an express service, we order today, deliver tomorrow, uh, that does factor into our analysis. Um, so I think that the classic cases that we have in terms of the, the reactive acquisitions are, uh, we recorded Algeria being a major importer several years ago, 
and Morocco, if you looked at the delivery statistics, was lagging. But if you looked at sort of our trade registers, which give a more qualitative approach, you'd see that orders being placed by Morocco sort of correspond to some degree with the orders and acquisitions by Algeria. And I think when I was talking about the azerbaijan Armenia situation, you also see that sort of reactive acquisitions lagging. Uh, and we also, because we provide information both on order dates and delivery dates, which as you say, can take place many years uh, apart, uh, we, we try to also provide that sort of information as much as possible. Um, with regards to why there's a mixed record, I suppose, in terms of how states have been able to absorb or take advantage of technology transfers to develop their own indigenous capabilities, I think there's a, a range of reasons there. The classical explanation is sort of industrial base. They have to have an existing uh, fairly advanced engineering and scientific uh, base on which to build. I think also in terms of the the arrangements that are, that are made between supplier and recipient is another factor. In some cases, our licensed production uh, data may just be sort of a delivery of a kit that gets assembled with a few components put in locally. But in other cases, it may be blueprints uh, that are utilized and almost all of the work is done in country. That's one of the things that we'd like to do further in terms of sort of splitting that up. But at the moment, that broad range of activities is, is lumped together. And I suppose you'd be looking at those who have a lot more local input in terms of production that have a, a far higher success rate. I think also with a few of the states that we're looking at, they've developed niches, and rather than trying to go for a, a broad range of being able to produce everything, which I think is the Indian approach from, from my understanding, there are some success stories such as Israel, which has emerged as a, as a major supplier by focusing upon certain high-tech aspects. And also I think it relates in some of these cases with regards to their own regional security situations. Uh, if they have a concern of an embargo, perhaps that might be a driver that, that actually leads you to be uh, seeking to be more self-sufficient. If you have a, a good relationship or you're seeking some major, uh, very expensive deals, you may be able to, to put more of a bargain in, into that sort of dimension. And as I said, I think at the moment, one of the factors we've seen is that, um, to crudely put it, it's a buyer's market at the moment in terms of the demands that some of the major importers are placing upon suppliers. And as I said, the complexities in terms of more cooperative production arrangements um, are making it sort of a less state-centric in some respects. Thank you. Tom? Uh, just let me talk about the complexity of multilateral production. If the final product is produced in country A, and country A have a, a jurisdiction over the export of that, that product from that country, so it's sure that country is exporting country. However, there are a lot of arrangements. Sometimes missile was produced in one country, launchers produced somewhere. So there's some complexity. And we do not really impose on rigorously on the rule, this should go. There's some guideline area in the operation of the register. But basically, it's up to the member states which decide on whether or not they report. So um, we're going to have to wrap it up. I think we've really covered a lot of, of ground today, and I, I think in a really good kind of logical order, because we had Paul provide us with the facts. And then we had Abdullah gives us the government policies, perceptions, how it's about choices. Uh, and then we, uh, you know, to have Tom give us what the international community can do, the transparency instruments. And then in the discussion to see that in today's world, it's all this multiplicity of actors, civil society, uh, the companies themselves, and also the, just the importance of these regional factors, uh, products as well as production uh, moving across borders. So anyhow, thank you very much for making this uh, a very worthwhile event. Thank you all. Thank you, our panelists.